the first thing that excited me about this episode is that it's the first one we got where it's Anakin and Obi-Wan together. And they do get yeah. split up when they go to the Malevolence, but there's a lot of interaction between them and a lot of kind of fun banter. And that's the things that I want to see is those two working together and having a relationship. And this is the first time other than the opening 20 minutes of the movie where we got that. And I, I think the voice actors do a great job. This is a much better version of Anakin than we ever saw in a movie. So to see him interact with Obi-Wan is, is really fun. And they had a, a great time together. This is a weird episode. This is General Grievous' Tom and Jerry episode. <laughs> because, man, he is, is Tom the Cat. He is running around getting bonked on the head and, and failing at every possible thing. He's getting garbage dumped on him and things are blowing up and falling on him. And he's bouncing off of walls, getting beat in every battle. But it was funny. <laughs> I, I, at first I was kind of annoyed because I've been the guy harping on, you need to build these bad guys up. But maybe I've just seen it enough that now I was kind of able to embrace the ridiculousness of everything that was going wrong for him. And, you know, he, he goes through this whole episode trying to save the male malevolence, uh, a word I continually mispronounce. So Me too. drink at home every time I say it wrong. But he, he's trying to save the ship and the rebels keep doing every or the uh, Republic keeps doing everything to blow it up. And, and eventually he thinks he's got it fixed and he's in his own starfighter and he's like, all right, guys, get out of here. And he talks to Dooku and then and he's telling Dooku how it's going well. And then he realizes that the Jedi actually screwed his hyperdrive. So the whole malevolence is going to crash into a moon. Yeah, they put the nav computer, they, 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 they steer the, through the nav computer coordinates. They steer the ship into a moon. <laughs> and, he's, and he's just watching this happen while Dooku's like, give us a report, give us the ship back. And he just flips the screen off. And, and the clicks, and he just takes off. And I was like, that sums up your whole day, man. So it's kind of over the top as it was, and I hope that theme isn't continual. I really got a kick out of it this episode. I will say those are the best parts about the episode. I didn't really care for it. You know, the the idea that you're going to have this sort of fun shoot 'em up episode is great, but I've come to expect with the first three episodes so much more in terms of theme. And this has no character development. Nothing really happens as far as the character. I mean, things happen, like the plot moves along, but it doesn't move along for character development in any meaningful way. It's just Padme being how Padme always has been. And a damsel in distress, right. which I really don't want to see a ton of. Right. And she's totally shoehorned in. Like, I found myself wondering, like, could real senators be tricked in the same way? Like, she's tricked. Her and 3PO come out there because somebody told her there was some sort of, like, mining convention or something. I, I can't remember exactly. No, so, so that, for, for, those totally who for those who haven't seen it, the Malevolence is fighting the Rebellion, or the, I keep saying the Rebellion, is fighting the Republic. And they know they're going to lose. So Dooku's big plan is to leak information to Padme that the banking clan wants to meet with her to negotiate a truce and she's excited because if she gets the banking clan on board then then they'll be able to win the war so they just give her the coordinates to where the malevolence is in this massive fight and she just flies to it and then immediately gets tractor beams could we do that with the senate like that's how you oh. stop tax cuts for the rich you know what i mean like you just I... tell a senator like hey tell three of them like hey you need to go to oklahoma there's some stuff going down banking and finance and then maybe all our uh, problems just are... tell some of our officials where porn stars are and i'm sure we could get them to go hey yo hey yo um i will say you talked about a funny moment there was another funny moment that i really liked uh, there, there's like this train system in the malevolence, and three PO is like trying to catch up, and he just gets hit by. <laughs> well, by a train. Obi Wan's gonna suck him. <laughs> Obi Wan's gonna is using the force to pull three PO to his train, and as he's getting pulled across, another train smacks him, which is great because C three PO is so annoying in yeah. everything he does that I was disappointed he was in this one, and then to see him get hit by a train was great. Yeah, yeah, I loved it. the The other problem is I know there's a lot of action in this, but it's just slow and boring. Nothing drew me to it this one action scene after another and it seems just like a, a vessel like this whole episode's a vessel to get padme and anakin to be seen together and it just you know laser blasts don't really do a whole lot for me if there's nothing behind it well and the train yard itself reminded me very much of the assembly factory in attack oh, of the clones point, yeah. uh which isn't something that i flash back to relatively fondly it seemed very video it, you could see a video game board being designed on what they were doing both in that train yard and in attack of the clones and that's what this felt like to me which i didn't enjoy particularly yeah you know, the dramatic tension it's underscored also by us knowing that grievous and obi-wan make it out alive to the next movie 
Yeah. And that's something I worry, am I going to have these negative feelings? Like, I look at some of the things that I've reviewed for the website, and I know that Han Solo is going to make it out of, you know, the story that Marjorie Liu wrote for him, but I never felt it. Like, I, I still felt, the because the character drew me in and, and what she was trying to do with the character. There's none of that here, and I'm really worried that that's going to continue on through the Clone Wars story, because that's going to be a long... Long couple of seasons, if that's the case. Yeah, the only thing I would say is that they did they did finally have Grievous fight with a lightsaber. And I think this is our first lightsaber on lightsaber battle of the TV show, if I'm thinking about it correctly. Because it's the first time Grievous did, and Dooku and... Did Yoda and Ventress fight in the first episode? They kind episode, of did, but it wasn't really, really like a fight. A he just threat. walked up and manhandled her with the Force. Thing. So that was good, and he was really strong in that battle. Like, Obi-Wan had to run away. It was the only time Grievous was strong in the whole episode. So that was nice to see that he was built up a tad bit for as much as he was knocked down throughout this one. But they, they did a lot of inconsistent stuff with characters, too. We just watched Plo Koon talk to clone troopers about how, don't worry, we're going to come save you. And Plo Koon in this episode is sitting on the Twilight, which is the, the main battle cruiser that everyone is on, except for Obi-Wan and Anakin and Padme. And he's telling Ahsoka, oh, they're screwed, we'll just have to keep blowing it up. Like... No Jedi ever wants to save a Jedi. It's like, you were just the guy in that spot, like, a minute ago. And for some reason, you have to just keep firing on this already disabled ship. Uh, so, so that rubbed me the wrong way. I mean, we already talked about the the Padme as a damsel in distress. I'm giving you this, you know, once more this season. And only once more this season if we get her being more than that in some other episodes. Because she can't just be be something that they use to get the Jedi to fight. Like, she has so, to be her own character. When you look at episode one, and I know you're not a big fan of episode one, uh, I think you rank that dead last, if I'm not mistaken. But not because of her. Right. Well, that's what I'm saying, is is in her role, she is a queen of an entire planet that brings together two groups of people that have never been able to agree on anything. She defeats the Trade Federation, who's trying to screw her over, and she's basically, a, she's represented as a really good and strong leader in that movie. She's basically leading her people through that whole thing. And now it's just weak. Yeah. And I expect more. And I don't know if that is, you know, a going to be a weakness of Tim Burns. But I, I, I agree with you. I don't want to keep seeing it. The, the only other highlight I want to give is they did reference Phantom Menace once in its stupidity. Because I believe it was a tongue-in-cheek reference. Where they get off the uh, Obi-Wan and, and Anakin get off of something. And Obi-Wan says, spitting is not for flying. And Obi-Wan, re or uh, Anakin responds, but spitting's a good trick. Ripping on Jake Lloyd's, and it's not Jake Lloyd's fault, but his horribly delivered lines in, in Phantom Menace, which, ugh, Jake Lloyd, ugh. I'm interested, because it seems like you enjoyed this one a lot more than me. Where do you rank it? Out of the four that we have listed, where does it rank? Yeah, that that is a hard one. It is uh, definitely... Definitely not last. I I'd probably put it third, uh, with with Shadow of Malevolence being the one I liked the least, uh, which is the bomber run episode. I think this one's basically for me on par with the first arc of the Malevolence, which I'm blanking on the name of. I believe it was Rising Malevolence. <laughs> <laughs> Appearance of Malevolence. Whatever of Malevolence. The second episode with Malevolence. The quest for peace. A ambush is still number one, so this is going to fall into that 2-3 that spot, but I have a feeling it may fall a little lower on yours. It's just four. I mean, it's just yeah. because of the lack of character development. I don't think you're wrong when you think that there are fun aspects. I don't think you're wrong where there are really funny moments. 3 feet, like I said, getting hit by the train or the, throwing the malevolence into the moon is just awesome. What a great way to end. <laughs> it's, but that's kind of how I felt at the end of this one. Like, yes, ram that thing into a moon. I am ready for something different. And the themes that are so important to me just weren't there for this. No character changes, um, not even Grievous. Although, the, I guess you can make the argument that the relationship between Dooku and Grievous, there is a little bit of a change there. And so, But there's... that's fluctuated every episode of this, this yeah. three-story arc, because in the first one, he's super mad at Grievous and is warning him he's going to lose his job. In the second episode he's of it, he's, you're the best! I'm so glad you're in charge of our ship. And in this one, he's down on him the whole time. I, I think if they were going to do a malevolence arc like this, it should have been two episodes. Yeah, three was way too much. I was ready for it to be done. Agreed. Let's talk about other nerd stuff that we're into. I'm a nerd. We have news for the beautiful people. There's a lot more of us in our view. What are you into these days, man? 
a couple weeks ago, we had a big news segment on uh, Denis Villeneuve, and we talked about Blade Runner, but neither of us had seen it, Blade Runner 2049, and I saw it a couple days after that and absolutely loved it. That is everything I would have wanted out of a Blade Runner sequel. I really, really like the first one as long as you get a, a cut with no narration and unicorns in it. This follow-up was fantastic. It's very, very slow. It's very moody, but it, it does everything that it needs to do both on its own movie and to continue what was started in Blade Runner. And some of my apprehensions when I heard they were making a, a sequel, things like, are they going to answer the question of whether Harrison Ford is a replicant? Will Ryan Gosling be a replicant? Is that going to be the new mystery? All those type of things. I don't want to give spoilers away, but they dealed with them pitch perfectly. I couldn't have thought of a better way to deal with both of those scenarios. So this is a long movie. It's two hours and 45 minutes, and it's a lot of brooding and a lot of long drawn out dialogue and pauses and things like that but i love that type of atmospheric work so if if you like the first one if you truly enjoy this i enjoy that i think you'll fall in love with this movie so i, I recommend it to, to everyone it's funny you say that because i wanted to also after our talk to watch that movie but you can't watch 2049 if you haven't seen the first one and i had fallen asleep so many times trying to watch the first one because it is a lot of things a lot of wonderful things but it is so damn slow which could make this one hard for you because this one is longer it could be it could be um so we'll see we were gonna watch that and then all of a sudden my daughter started watching raiders of the lost ark and we couldn't get her off of that so that we could watch um blade runner if it can get you through it for me blade blade runner has the most perfect final monologue that you could see from rucker hauer it's absolutely fantastic It, it it's it's touching and emotional in ways you wouldn't think, and it's a fantastic scene. So just know that that's coming at the end and that you're going to look at something that's just fantastically delivered, and th- that can power you through some of the, the down parts. It does with a film like Apocalypse Now, which is a really long film in stretches, but it gets that payoff at the end. So I will take your words and hold them dear, but I took your words and held them dear on a different different thing that you talked about and that was heaven's gate i listened to the entirety of that podcast and uh really i don't want to say enjoyed it but i i I felt moved by it and there was a part in the final episode where he says you know i hope they made it and he kind of summed up exactly how i felt like you know you have all these people who were searching for something in their life and at the end they all decided to leave their vessels and you know, I had always looked at that as something to be made fun of, but when you learn about the people and look, learn about what they were searching for, you know, obviously they didn't, I don't believe that they found it, but I kind of wish they did. But since I went and sp- listened to what, like 10 hours of this, you're going to do me 40 minutes between now and the next time we meet. I would like you to listen to Jane's Addiction, Ritual de la Habitual. That was what I've been into this week I've listened to that album a couple times and I'm interested because you don't like jam music but I've been paying special attention because there aren't you know in jam music you'll get a lot of the same thing over and over and over and I think that's what you don't like about it here it's kind of like jam music but it switches enough where I want to oh. see if it holds your attention and Perry Pharrell is just awesome so I want to see what you think of Ritual de la Habitual if you'll do me the honor well I haven't listened to it all the way through but I've certainly heard songs and enjoyed a lot of them so I, I can give that a try Excellent. Well, thank you for giving us a try. We're going to head out now. This has been Maya Madrid. You can find find, find me on Twitter at Maya Madrid. And over there, Luke, where can they find you? You can find me at Luke underscore Neitzel, N-E-I-T-Z-E-L. And you can check out reviews covering not only Star Wars, but politics and sports and other things at our website, which is www.kidseriously.wordpress.com. Bye, everybody. <laughs>